Hello, welcome to Kerry's Wheel of the Year. Today I thought I would talk about animism because it's raining quite hard and I've been shouting at the rain. So animism comes from the Latin, spirit, breath, life. It's quite funky really, I like it. Um, and attributing, uh, animism is the, is the act of attributing um, a belief that everything has a living soul or, you know, its own uh, consciousness in some way, shape or another. And the more we go on um, with science and all kinds of, you know, investigative things, the more we realise that everything does have a conscience of some kind or another. Um, I'm just, I've got seed tray down here. I've got some baby kohlrabi and cabbage primo actually um, which are about to be rehomed um, yeah so it got me thinking as I was yelling at the rain to you know not be quite so loud because I'm trying to record something <laughs> and kind of feeling like it was being a bit malicious <laughs> which it isn't obviously it's rain <laughs> it's just raining um, I was thinking about that and wondering how other people felt about animism and how they respond to wildlife and nature and the world around them generally. Because it's always been something, ever since I was a child, I, I have personally had the sense of relating to things all the way around me as if they were alive, regardless of what they were. I've recorded it, thoughts and feelings, and the same as mine. I don't, I don't differentiate, you know, from my thoughts and feelings um, and the world around me, um, which sometimes makes life difficult, especially as you're a gardener, because, I mean, let's face it, out in the garden, it's a bit like a war zone, especially as I came over this morning. And the other day, I planted nine, um, nine little dwarf bean plants out with the sweet peas. There's three left. Now, you know, the animist bit of me says, oh, the slugs and snails are just doing what they do. And the gardener bit of me goes, damn it, blasted things are eating my dinner <laughs> or my potential dinner. It's not even getting to a potential dinner because they've scoffed a lot of it. And, you know, how, as an animist, do you deal? How do you deal with that, you know? Do you go out for wholesale slaughter and get the slug pellets out? Do you, you know, kind of go, oh, well, you know, maybe I'll go hungry. <laughs> no, um, no, you can't because, you know, if you're trying to live a sustainable life, which I am, you know, I'm really trying very hard to make it so that I impact this world as little as possible because you know it's my home it's the place that nurtures me it's the place that gives all all life that we know of so i have to look after it but i also have to eat <laughs> and, you know and putting all this effort and work and well let's you know not not beat about the bush here lots of money into it as well they don't know they don't care they're not malicious about the whole thing 
you know, like said about the ants, just doing their thing, you know, can't, they can't help it, they're hungry too. So what do you do in an allotment situation? It's a bit of a moral conundrum for me. When you spend 15 minutes trying to hook a marauding veg-eating beast out of the new water barrel. What's wrong with this picture? I mean, they literally are. There are thousands. I mean, there's always thousands, but I mean, there's really thousands. It's out of balance on my allotment. And, you know, you can turn to the gardening gurus on the internet, such as, you know, I mean, um, Charles Dowding, who is um, the no dig guru that um, got me into the no dig bit on my bed, on my allotments, and various other people, permaculture and all those other ideas. Um, and see what their advice is. And their advice is generally, don't give them a home. Don't give them a home means, you know, get rid of all of the nooks and crannies that they would normally um, hide in. So don't have wooden sides to your raised beds and keep the grass really um, down all the way around the edges so they've got nowhere to hide. Um, that's a big one, apparently. Um, so... You know, that's one of the things because I, I spent a lot of time and a lot of money putting all of my raised beds in and getting the, the, the beds how I wanted them, all with wooden sides over the past five years. And they're all starting to, to break down now and, and kind of, you know, show their age and their home to a million billion wood lice, slugs and snails. So, you know, it's true. It does give them places to hide. And no matter what the RHS says, wood lice do eat your plants, particularly, what's it called? Celeriac. Yeah, I love my celeriac. There's nothing worse than going up to your celeriac to try and pull it for dinner and finding that it's actually a shell because the wood lice have scoffed a lot of it. I mean, you know, slugs and snails and wood lice um, and other creatures like that, that's what they do. They break everything down. You know, if, if it wasn't for them, nothing... Them and the worms in the soil, obviously, to break down all of the... Um, humus and stuff nothing would break down nothing would turn into fabulous compost so it's a dilemma so my next mission as the beds start to fall apart is to repurpose any decent wood and I'm going to show you something I don't know if you'll be able to see it maybe let's have a look you see on that leaf there's a little red dot red spider mite they infested the place last year I think they don't like humidity well do you know what I'm going to do with these sad as it is I'm actually just going to rub them off like I do with the cat caterpillars <laughs> caterpillars on the brassicas fortunately i think most of well actually i didn't rub off the cat i didn't kill the caterpillars i just chucked them outside and hoped the birds would take them away but um that's me deferring responsibility <laughs> but as far as the things in the greenhouse go i think the red spider mite are too small for that kind of job and they're all on the aubergines. They seem to really like the aubergines. They don't seem to be on the tomatoes yet, but we'll see. It's very easy to 
um, compromise your moral stance on everything has a right to life um, when they're destroying your plants. It's easier to get rid of them when you can't actually see their faces. That's bleak and dark, but it's true. It seems the red spider mite are not the only people interested in my aubergines. I mean, quite what he's interested in, I have absolutely no idea. I'm quite hoping it's the red spider mites. Because, well, that would be helpful. Look at him. I'm not exactly sure what he is. But, you know... Funky. Look at the colours. I'm going to just spend a bit of time in a minute eliminating the red spider mite. Sorry. I mean, I do get ladybirds and things like that in here, but they don't seem to go for the red spider mite. But, um, you know, they go for the aphids. Yes. Um... So I try to encourage, that's the other, that's the other advice. Try to encourage as many natural predators as possible. It's one of the reasons for the, um, the wildlife pond up the end, which I've, I've got, teeny weeny baby frogs. Can you see? I'm going to try not to drop my phone in the water, but they're sitting on the edge. There's a frog. Welcome, little dude. I love you. The next door fella, um, as you come in through the alleyway, he's got a, a pond like this size, like that size. He's got newts in it. I mean, that's unusual. Come on, newts. Wow. So I think my little frogs have come. Oh, he's got frogs and newts in that pond. How they coexist together, I've no idea. Um, and with all of the slow worms that are around. I love the slow worms. I was so happy. Um, anybody who doesn't know what a slow worm is, um, it's a legless lizard. It's, a, oh my God, just caught sight of another spider coming out of the cracks. Um, yeah, slow worms. Um, they are legless lizards. Um, and they look, they're like, you know, I mean, the biggest ones are about that long and about as thick as my thumb. But most of the ones I see are sort of smaller than that. They can't bite you. They don't do any harm, but they do eat slugs. And I don't know if they eat snails. I mean, I don't know how they would eat snails, you know. But they are fabulous and there's tons of them here. And I try to make little homes for them all over the place. What was I saying? Oh, hello. There you are. See? Wildlife everywhere. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but there, on the little Brussels sprout, is a hoverfly doing exactly what I was saying. It is working its way around the aphids that have decided to join us. Go on, your mum. Get in there. Sort them out. Oh, God, I've just spotted on the brassica a caterpillar mist, cabbage white, little rat bag. That's got to go. I shall fling that outside as well. I don't know if they home as well as slugs and snails. 500 metres, apparently, slugs and snails can home. I'm still thinking that what I might have to do is... Um, is bag them all up and give them to Dave when he goes for the a walk with the dog over the harbour. <laughs> and he can tip them over on the place that they're rewilding over there. <laughs> That's one way to deal with an infestation. <laughs> Poor Dave. So I had a bit of a go round the greenhouse. And I found lots of red spider mite all over everything there's some white fly just starting on the um on the tomatoes 
and whatever that green thing was, it looks a bit like a grasshopper, but not quite. Not seen one that colour before. Intriguing. I'm hoping it's after the beast is. But uh, I think one of the biggest problems with the greenhouse is I, if I don't get over here for a few days, the watering's a bit feast and famine, and I think that's also something that encourages the wildlife to come in and go, oh, these plants are in touch, let me just kill them off, you know, because um, the, the plants are not robust enough to see off an attack. So it's my fault. Another thing you can do um, is companion planting. Reducing the habitats, encouraging in predators, you know, the no, bit, the no dig thing is really good because when you're not disturbing the soil, you get let the microbes and things in the soil are, and the mycorrhizome are all working together to kind of hold and exchange nutrients um, and the soil is healthier, basically. So you don't have to do so much feeding or so much... Um, stuff so you, you actually allow the system to do what it was meant to do if you don't disturb it it's it's I mean it's billions of years old I mean who are we to think that we well, I'm a human being obviously I know much better about the soil than you know these these damn microbes I mean what's that all about I read Merlin Sheldrake's book um, Entangled Life and he's a biologist as well as a kind of really funky spiritual um, dude and a musician. Um, and his dad is Rupert Sheldrake. And it blew my mind. I mean, it's quite a, a heavy mix of science because he's a biologist who's been studying this stuff for years. A microbiologist. Is it microbiologist? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, read the book. It's blooming amazing. Um, and one of the things that Merlin Sheldrake says in this book is that perhaps when people engage with um, the psilocybin experience, they learn to communicate or the mushrooms teach them how to communicate like a mushroom and I've, I've I've spoken to people over the years who have said that they have had experiences of feeling connected if you change your perspective if you I mean a lot of people don't <laughs> a lot of people find animism a bit weird um, you know, what, a stone having some sort of consciousness or, you know, a blade of grass having a consciousness. But they do. They they have and they respond to their lives, the, the world around them. They exchange with each other. They warn each other. Plants warn each other when there's... Um, when there's predator or whether or when there's um, a danger, there's I think they did experiments with um, like field beans and things like that, um, and something would happen. I mean, I'm guessing they tortured one end of the field somehow or another, and there was a chemical response that waved through the the field, um, and the plants will up the toxins or, or the, the things that would be um, unpleasant to tasting to the predator um, to make it less palatable. Now that's sentience to me. That, that's, you know, that's a response. That's a response to um, an action by another being. And it's a communication. So our a limited points of view as as human beings um, sometimes you know can't quite handle the fact that you have to be conscious of everything because everything has some kind of sentience our brains basically make up our perception of what's real based on previous experience 
our conditioning as children uh, um, and adults, I guess, you know, by experiences. And we make the best guess at what truth and perception is. <laughs> so, you know, when po people turn around and say, oh, pigeons flying around, um, when people turn around and say, oh, you know, that's that has no life, it has no uh, consciousness, that's, that's a load of old nonsense. <sighs> really? Just because you can't perceive it and you can't understand it doesn't mean it's not real doesn't mean that consciousness or um, the ability to feel sense or perceive is not there in something and that's both I, I think sometimes people are a bit wary of that because that would mean that they would have to take more responsibility for what they do in their lives you know they can't just blithely go through you know chopping a tree down and and not thinking about it or what well, mind you if you're a lumberjack and your life depends um you know your livelihood depends on it that that must be a quandary couldn't do that job i love trees too much i find it really difficult pruning but yeah how we think about animism have a think about how you feel about animism, how you respond to the world around you. I mean, go and watch the <laughs> Roald Dahl Tales of the Unexpected where the chap um, creates a machine that can hear plants and he goes to experiment with it by chopping uh, into a big tree and uh, right by a, um, a field of wheat that's being mowed. It's terrifying. I first saw that when I was a, a quite an early teenager and I was going through my first sort of um, vegetarian um, phase, which has never really gone away, but I'm more of a flexitarian, not a vegetarian. Um, <laughs> and he hacked into this big tree and heard it roar on his machine. And he was like, and then he turned to look at the field of wheat next to him being mowed and was like horrified. It, it really, I was in the kitchen trying to chop up carrots after that for my dinner. <laughs> I was like, everything's alive. I shouldn't eat anything. And, um, and I had to have a stern word with myself. Otherwise, I would have starved to death. Um, I already didn't eat as much as I should have done at, at at the time, probably I would say 85% of my meals are are veggie, which is another reason why I am desperate for this allotment to be my main food source, because it could be. Um, but also because of my animistic tendencies. You know, I want to put some love into my food. I want to have an exchange with it. I want to have a sense that I've nurtured it and then in return it will nurture me, you know. And m my goal is to have food that feels good. It's not processed. It hasn't driven, you know, it hasn't travelled miles try to eat things that are in season you know and try to love the earth put as much love into the earth and as much care into what I consume be that food or be that in life generally that I'm doing my bit for the planet in every way I can um Indigenous peoples all over the world have, um, they view the world uh, and the wildlife and the plants as allies, as brothers and sisters, because that's what they are, you know. They're our brothers and sisters. They're, you know, they're our relatives. They're part of us. We're part of them. How would we treat our relatives? How do you treat your relatives? It's a question to ask. 
That's my thoughts on animism. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. This mint is just alive. Look at that. That's so weeny. It's about the size of my thumbnail. Look at it all. Just glorious. It's completely alive with all kinds of living things. I'm very happy.